Hi and welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we're going to be exploring the case of the murder of Lynn Bryan in Cornwall in 1998. Lynn's murder occurred during a normal day while she was out walking her dog. It was violent and unnecessary and it's for this reason that it remains one of the most notorious unsolved crimes for Devon and Cornwall police. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. Ruin High Lanes is a village in South Cornwall, just under 12 miles from the cathedral city of Truro. The village is located not far from the Roseland Heritage Coast, which is a peninsula to the south of Ruin High Lanes. It's known for its picturesque coastline and landscapes, and has attracted many photographers and landscape artists over the years. Lynn Bryant had lived in the village her whole life, and had married her husband Peter, and raised a family there during the 1980s and 90s. She had two daughters, Lee and Erin, and in 1998 had recently become a grandmother at the age of 40, to her first grandchild. Her family later explained that Lynn was very excited to become a grandmother and had been collecting Disney videos that she would watch with her grandchildren. Her eldest daughter would later say that her mum was a very family orientated person who lived for her children and husband. While her children were growing up, she spent a lot of quality time with them, often reading and taking them to school on her bicycle. She was described as popular and friendly and was known as a happy person. Her daughter would later say that they were just a normal family and her mother, father and sister lived happily in the village. During 1998, Lynn was enjoying her time as a grandmother and spending lots of time with her grandson, as well as living at home with her husband and her eldest daughter Erin, who was 19 at the time. At around 2.30pm on the 20th of October 1998, a holidaymaker was driving up the lane opposite the Ruin High Lanes Methodist Church in the village. The lane is remote and surrounded by trees on both sides. It's not a busy spot and not frequented by many people on a day-to-day basis. The holidaymaker made their way up the lane until they came to a gate that led to a field on the left-hand side. As they passed the gateway, they looked to the side and noticed a body lying on the grass. It soon became apparent that the body was that of a woman and that she had been attacked. The holiday maker immediately contacted the emergency services and it's reported that a 999 call was logged at 2.34pm that afternoon. Just over 15 minutes later, the air ambulance arrived to the scene and the woman was officially declared dead. As police arrived to process the scene, it didn't take them long for them to identify the woman. It was 40-year-old Lynn Bryant. It was clear that she had been attacked, and it would later be established that her cause of death was due to several stab wounds in her back, neck and chest. Police would later state that these stab wounds had come as a result of a prolonged attack that may have lasted a while. This attack was a shock for everyone particularly when the community discovered that it had been Lynn that had been murdered. No one could quite believe that anyone would want to attack her, particularly in the middle of the day in their small village. Police were immediately sure that they were dealing with a murder and treated the scene as such, cordoning the area off and searching around the scene in an effort to find any evidence as to what or who may have been involved in the crime. While the area was being forensically searched, the police began looking into Lynn's movements that day to try and establish where she had been and at what time. The area in which her body had been discovered was remote, however it was known that Lynn often frequented the area on walks with her lurcher dog Jay. It was later discovered that this is what she was doing on the 20th of October. From speaking to people in the community and those that knew Lynn, they were able to put together a timeline for her day, which was helpful to narrow down the window that the perpetrator could have struck. It was known that Lynn's day had been relatively normal and that in the morning she had cleaned a local house in the village before visiting her parents and then returning home. 
It's reported in the Shropshire Star newspaper that Lynn was next seen at around 12.45 that afternoon. She took her grey Ford Sierra car to the Harris garage, located in the village of Tregony, around four miles from her home in Bruin High Lanes. When she got there, however, she found that they didn't have fuel at that petrol station, so she went back to Ruin High Lanes and visited a garage called Chenoweth's. It was known that she bought petrol and some of the groceries and milk while she was there. After this, Lynn then returned home, where she saw her eldest daughter Erin. The pair had some lunch together and watched Emmerdale. Not long after that, at around 1.30pm, Lynn set back out again this time on a walk with her dog Jay. Lynn regularly took Jay on this walk and would frequent similar routes when she went out. Lynn was seen shortly after setting out walking along the main lane, which led towards Ruin High Lane's Methodist Church. It's reported that around 1.45 to 2pm, a passing motorist saw Lynn speaking to a man at the junction at the church. The man was described as clean-shaven. It was around half an hour later that Lynn's body was discovered in the gateway at the field. This timeline was definitely useful to the police and showed them that Lynn had been having a relatively normal day before her death and there was nothing that pointed to her being a high-risk victim. This made her murder seem even more perplexing. How had Lynn been murdered in the half an hour since she had last been seen by witnesses? The time period between her leaving the house and being murdered was only an hour, and this was a very short window for the crime to have happened. Police also sought witnesses for the time after Lynn's murder, and they managed to find a local farmer who had seen something in the half an hour after her body was discovered. He told police that at around 2.45 to 3pm, he had spotted a man walking through the field and away from the crime scene. This was an important line of inquiry that the police began to investigate. The other piece of interesting information was that Lynn had been seen speaking to a man at the junction to the church, which was just opposite the lane where her body was eventually found. Was this relevant to the investigation? While detectives were gathering information from the local area, Lynn's body and the surrounding area was being forensically searched. An analysis of Lynn's injuries showed that she had several stab wounds and it was later found that these had probably been inflicted using a single-edged blade. This could have been a weapon like a pen knife or a small kitchen knife. A fingerprint search was made of the local area, however this sort of weapon was not recovered from the vicinity. When Lynn's clothes were analysed, detectives also recovered a number of what were described as vivid blue fibres. It's reported in the independent newspaper that these fibres were mostly commonly used in polo shirts and jumpers. The fibres were compared to those in Lynn's clothes and in items from her home, however they were not a match to anything that she owned. This suggested to detectives that these fibres had possibly been left by the perpetrator. Another odd thing that police noted about Lynn is that her glasses were missing. Lynn usually wore them and they were not found on her body or at the scene. Detective Inspector Stuart Ellis, who is the senior investigating officer on the reinvestigation of the case, later discussed elements of Lynn's murder. He told the independent newspaper that there had been no attempt to conceal Lynn's body and that she had been left out in the open next to the gateway. He also stated, We know she must have fought against her attacker. She had injuries to her face and her clothing was disturbed. He also added another feature to the crime, saying, I think it's a fair conclusion to assume this was a sexually motivated murder. The police also revealed further information, saying that it was believed that the perpetrator would have been covered in blood during the struggle with Lynn, and that due to the area where it occurred, they would also have been covered in mud. When asked about the man that was seen walking through the field just after the discovery of Lynn's body, Detective Inspector Ellis stated, This was a very unusual occurrence as this field does not have a footpath and in the farmer's experience was not used by any walkers. He was wearing normal clothes and shoes, which again is very odd. 
Detective Inspector Ellis also commented on the man that had been seen speaking to Lynn just before her death. He explained that he was described as being clean-shaven and in his thirties, but with no other distinguishing features to speak of. The police did appeal for this man to come forward so that he could be eliminated from inquiries. Interestingly, both the man seen speaking to Lynn and the one seen walking through the field were both described as clean-shaven. Detectives, however, did not state that the two men were the same person and they were not sure that this was the case. Another piece of evidence that proved important to the case was a witness sighting at the Chenoweth's petrol station. This was the second petrol station that she visited that day at around 1.05pm. Witnesses stated that a white van pulled onto the forecourt of the petrol station at the same time as Lynn. The driver was a bearded male and his van was described as scruffy. This information was also published in the hope that the man would come forward and speak to police. These sightings were important to the investigation, however there was no direct link between these men and the murder itself. This did not give the police much to work on, and in the weeks and months after Lynn's murder, it seemed that there had not been much progress. Detectives did conduct many interviews with local residents, and began to take DNA samples during the original investigation, hoping that these would help narrow down the suspects. It's reported in a BBC article that during the original investigation into Lynn's murder, 6,000 DNA samples had been taken. Unfortunately, despite police appeals, information did not lead to any new tips. Just a couple of weeks after Lynn's murder, her case was featured on Crime Watch. The events of October the 20th were reenacted for the public, and the evidence that police had at the time was also documented. The reconstruction gave Lynn's case further exposure, and it was hoped that this would also lead to new evidence. Another three months went by without any new information coming in. However, in February 1999, a quite dramatic discovery was made in the same gateway where Lynn had been found. A passerby had been on the lane and noticed a pair of tortoiseshell glasses lay on top of the mud in the gateway. These were passed on to police and they were identified as belonging to Lynn Bryant. These were the same glasses that had been missing from her body when it was discovered four months previously. This discovery was perplexing. How had they been found all this time after her body? Detective Inspector Ellis addressed this discovery, saying that a fingertip search had been conducted at the time and that nothing had been found. Were they found by somebody and returned to the scene, or were they put there by the murderer? This discovery did pose a lot of questions. If they had been returned to the scene by the murderer, why? It appeared that the glasses had been placed on top of the mud after the search had taken place, but the reasons for this were unclear. Suspicions began to emerge that the perpetrator may have been from the local area due to the remoteness of the scene. The fact that the attack had happened in such a rural place on the lane where not many people went walking suggested that whoever had committed it had some local knowledge. The community in Ruin High Lanes were shocked and horrified by Lynn's death and her family were coming to terms with what had happened. Lynn was a family orientated person and her husband, children and grandson now had to adapt to life without her. This made her case even more of a priority to police, who knew that they had to find out as much as they could about what had happened to her. In April 1999, it's reported that the first investigative review was carried out in Lynn's case, which was labelled Operation Hermitic. In December of that year, a coroner eventually ruled that Lynn had been unlawfully killed, confirming what the police and her friends and family already knew. Lynn had been murdered. The concerning thing was that over a year after Lynn's murder, the police did not appear to be any closer to finding out who had committed it. For the next four years, this is the way that the case stood, until 2002, when a second investigative review took place. This, however, did not uncover anything new in the case, and time once again passed. In 2007, it's reported that a full forensic review took place, 
and in 2008, the police once again appealed to the public as the 10-year anniversary of the murder came around. The appeal did receive a number of tips, and in the next few years, all of these lines of inquiry were looked into by Devon and Cornwall Police. Sadly, no new information was once again reported, until 2016, when a breakthrough was found. Forensic reinvestigation of swabs taken from Lynn's body and the scene had revealed a partial DNA profile. This was a huge new discovery in a case that had not had much new evidence in the past 18 years. Around 6,000 people had provided samples to the police during the original investigation, however it was reported in a BBC article that these samples had been destroyed after a change in legislation in 2013. This meant that police forces had to destroy some DNA samples, and these included the ones taken during Lynn's investigation. This was of course another blow to the case, however in October of 2016, Devon and Cornwall Police began the huge task of retaking DNA samples from those people who lived, or had lived in the area at the time. It was hoped that this would find a match to the partial profile recovered. This profile was also ran against the national database to establish if the perpetrator had committed other crimes which could be linked, however this turned up nothing of relevance. Two years later in 2018, the 20-year anniversary of Lynn's murder came around. Police once again used this as an opportunity to appeal for more information. Devon and Cornwall Police published several videos showing Ruin High Lanes and the area that Lynn had been murdered. They documented the area using a drone and appealed for anyone that knew anything about the crime to come forward with information. Lynn's daughter Lee also conducted an interview with the police, discussing how the case had affected her and her family over the years. Lee was 41 in 2018 and explained how it had really got to her that she was now older than her mum was when she died. Lee also stated that she believed that her mother's killer was still out there and that it feels as though someone is watching you. Lee stated, I have felt like that for a very long time. We are just hoping that maybe there is somebody out there who had suspicions at the time, but wasn't able to do anything about it. Detective Inspector Ellis also explained the police's frustration that they had been unable to solve the case. He stated to the BBC, This type of case is rare in such a quiet, rural location. It has been a frustration that somebody has been able to get into that rural location, commit such a murder and not be seen or identified by anybody. After the 2018 appeal, police explained that they had received around 160 calls and messages in relation to Lynn's case, and that these tips had led to around 27 new lines of inquiry that they were able to investigate. This was a great response and the police began looking into this new possible evidence. It's also reported in the Plymouth Herald that detectives confirmed that they were investigating 13 people further in relation to the case. They stated that some of these people were known to the inquiry, and some were new, however they would all be asked to provide a DNA sample to compare to the partial profile that they already had on file. Since 2018, there has been no more information published about new lines of inquiry or possible progress on the case. Lynn's case has continually been in the public eye and there have been a number of different theories put forward for what could have possibly happened to her. Her case has also been linked to several other cases over the years. Lynn's murder is often discussed in relation to two other murders that took place between the years 1987 and 1997. The first murder which is often discussed is that of 66-year-old Helen Fleet. Helen lived with her sister in Western Supermare in Somerset and enjoyed walking her dogs in the nearby Walbury Woods. This is what she decided to do around midday on March 28, 1987. Screams were heard coming from the woods at around 12.20, but it wasn't until around 20 minutes later when a fellow dog walker heard barking and found Helen lying dead on the ground. She had been hit around the head, stabbed ten times and then strangled. 
the attack was so violent and in broad daylight. A large investigation was quickly established to try and solve Helen's murder. Witnesses gave police information about ewes that had been seen in the area and one that was spotted running away from the scene at the time. There were also reports of Helen talking to a youth while walking her dogs a couple of days before the murder. E-fits were compiled, however nobody came forward with information about Helen's death. The police were just as stumped about why Helen had been killed and could not find any evidence to point to a particular suspect. In 1997, another murder occurred which had some similar features, primarily someone out walking their dog. On the 15th of November 1997, 14-year-old Kate Bushell agreed to walk her neighbour's dog close to her home in Exeter in Devon. She did not, however, return home, and her father went out to look for her in the vicinity of their home. He would later find her body in a field just off Exwick Lane. She had sustained a knife wound to her throat. Investigation identified witnesses who saw a man running away from the scene through a field and a man in a blue car which was parked in a lay-by in the lane. At a 2017 appeal 20 years after Kate's murder, police appealed for information about these people that had been spotted at the time. They also revealed that orange fibres from non-fluorescent workwear was found on Kate's body and on a country style close to the murder scene. Interestingly, in all three cases, Helen's, Kate's and Lynn's, the police stated that they believed the killer had local knowledge of the area in order to carry out the murder, due to the remoteness of the areas in which the bodies were found. These three cases have been linked together due to the fact that they were all females who were in remote areas walking dogs. A knife also appears to have been used at all crime scenes. The police have never officially linked any of these cases together, however speculation continues in the cases. In 2016, former intelligence officer Chris Clark stated that he believed that the three cases could be linked, as several features were similar. They were all walking dogs in remote areas. They had all been stabbed and all of the dogs remained unharmed. They also all remain unsolved until the present day. It has to be said that these are similarities that all of the murders have, however there are several differences. The murders all occurred in different areas of the country, their ages were drastically different and witnesses had spotted several different types of people in the area at the time. Detectives on each of the investigations also stated that the perpetrator must have local knowledge of that particular area to have carried it out without being seen. The idea that the same perpetrator carried out all three murders is not one that police are officially confirming at this point, and in all three cases the respective police forces have stated that all cold cases are reviewed periodically and remain open. This is the status of Lynn's case at the moment, with police saying that they are continuing to review the DNA evidence and follow the lines of inquiry that they currently have. Detective Inspector Ellis stated in the Independent newspaper in 2018 This was the murder of an innocent housewife, mum and grandmother who didn't deserve to die in such horrendous circumstances. Years have gone by but this has not lessened the pain and rawness of what happened to her that day. Her family has suffered for 20 years living their lives knowing that the offender remains free. This is definitely the case for Lynn's murder and that of Helen and Kate. Their families still have no answers or closure for what happened to their loved ones, and they deserve to know the answer. If you know anything about Lynn Bryant's murder in 1998, please contact Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. You can also contact Crime Stoppers if you have any information about Kate Bushell's murder. There is a £10,000 reward available for any information that leads to the perpetrator. If you have information about Helen Fleet's murder in 1987, then please contact Detective Sergeant Peter Frake from the Major Crime Review Team on 101. Thank you for listening to today's episode. If you would like to read more about the cases talked about in this episode, I want to point you in the direction of an excellent write-up by Paul, the true crime enthusiast. I will link the blog post in the show notes. 
I want to thank, as always, our Patreon supporters who really help to keep the podcast going. If you want to know about what we offer on there, including bonus episodes and ad-free early access, then have a look at the link in the show notes. If you want to support us further, you can leave us a review wherever you listen, or just connect on social media at Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and also find us on YouTube, where you can subscribe. If you want to buy any tickets for CrimeCon, the link will be in the show notes, and remember to use our code UNSEEN for 10% off. If you have any suggestions for cases, I would love to hear them, so please do contact me on social media or at theunseenpod at gmail.com. I hope to have you back next time, and as always, I'm Caprice, and this has been Unseen. Unseen.